Well, hello there, and welcome to the 125th edition of DF Direct Weekly, which is still our weekly discussion show where we discuss the latest gaming and technology news. And this one is being shot uh, on the eve of Gamescom. Uh, just a few days from now, we're going to be heading out to the show. Uh, joining me on this one is also the people who will be joining me at Gamescom. First of all, John Linneman. Hello. That's right, Rich. I'm looking forward to seeing you there. It's been a while. Uh, we're yep. going to see some cool stuff, I hope. And it's going to be hot. Absolutely. <laughs> the oh, last God. time I was physically in your presence was for the uh, Xbox Series X reveal I in know. Seattle. It was a long time ago. It was a long time. Man. And uh, also joining me, somebody I actually saw last year uh, mm. for the Intel interview, Alex Battaglia. Yeah, that was great with Tom Peterson. Uh, and then afterwards, drinking beers and talking with everyone from like... <laughs> Uh, computer base. It was awesome time. But yes, I'm here today, of course, for DF Direct, talking to you about stuff, including Intel news. Absolutely, yes. We've got some more hot uh, hashtag Tom Peterson content. <laughs> <laughs> Tom P. Oh, gosh. Uh, P. -P. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move into the first news topic. Okay, so it is going to be Gamescom week. Um, when you see this, we're going to be there. There's been, I'd say, sort of muted announcements as to what we can expect to see there. Uh, Jeff Keighley has done his customary expectations management for the opening night presentation. He's saying that we're going to see a lot of great stuff, but it's going to be stuff that we've likely seen before, which I think is absolutely fair enough uh, cool. considering. Um, yeah, I guess we should start there. Expectations. What do you really want to see? What are you looking forward to see? I'm going to start with you, John. Oh man, that's a that's a tricky one. I mean, I, there are some things I want to see. Uh, I'm hoping we'll get to see something like Alan Wake too. Uh, that right. would be great. Um, obviously, I'm curious if there's any sort of hardware rumblings from any of the big companies, specifically on the PC side. Who knows? I mean, Germany is PC country after all, so it makes sense, <laughs> right, to announce that. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple other projects on the agenda that I probably can't mention yet that signed up to see that i'm very excited to see um and really i i want to check out the retro area of course even though that's not like the latest in tech that should be fun but i'm really just excited to get together with you guys and you know go around the show floor see see what's out there you know because it's germany if we walk out on the show floor anything that's potentially violent will be turned away from the public area forcing you to go around through the queue to get behind the wall and see it because you know got to avert the eyes Violence. usk baby <laughs> wow you know how it is yeah so you're basically looking for uh, prohibited ultra violence i i am there for the most violent of games that's what i want to see <laughs> okay fair enough uh, that's a sentiment I'm sure you could agree with, right, Alex? Oh yeah, that's why I play games just for the violence. Of course, <laughs> there's no there's no other reason that I play games. Uh, have ever played games? Um, I'm excited about yeah, seeing it on the way too. Because last time we saw it was kind of some sort of they didn't exactly announce. I think it was PlayStation Five ish of a build. I think it, that's what they said it was running <laughs> it, it, on. It was a PS5 build, yes. No yeah. ish about it. <laughs> no ish about it, but they had a little bit of wonky performance and stuff. Um, so I'm curious to see if we can finally see the PC version of that game uh, and whatever that entails, because the last time they launched a game uh, that we actually could play on PC in the West uh, was um, Control, essentially. Uh, and that uh, is a PC showcase for ray tracing. It and is. it's been a long time since we've seen Northlight, what they've been advan advancing on it, because, you know, Northlight's been advancing ray tracing since 2019 when John saw it like running on DGX That's all right. the way back then. Oh my God. Uh, and it's been a while, John, I know. <laughs> um, and I'm curious to see what they've done because they've had the time now to adjust, you know, um, maybe some of the scaling in the game due to uh, the release of AMD Radeon, as well as the uh, console hardware where we already saw, like, they moved to a checkerboard um, RT reflections there when enabled on console. I'm curious if, if those kind of things will be in the PC build, if there's going to be other things in the PC build, because now we've got DLSS 3, we've got, like, all these other things that NVIDIA is pushing. I imagine NVIDIA is going to be the sponsor of the game. Um, I'm just really curious to see all that. And as well, uh, I know I'm going to be going a bit ahead here, but I did read Stalker 2 is going to be there. I'm very curious if that's the PC or some other version of the game. Right. 
I'd say it's most likely to be PC, right? You'd think? Yeah, I'd, I'd hope so. The first time they showed it off, it was definitely PC. And, you know, it is a UE5 game. Yeah. And we've been, we haven't really been seeing beyond the demos of like the Matrix and stuff like that. A lot of the press stuff around UE5 is actually focusing always on just showing the PC version so far for a lot of things. Um, maybe just because UE5 is still so early and getting optimization in for that primary version of the game on console is like a last minute not a last minute effort but something that where it gets in a really polished state only towards the end of a project um so i'm curious to see which version of that we'll see interesting yeah i mean there's going to be a ton of stuff that's actually playable that's been announced including payday 3 including stalker 2 sonic superstars john that's exciting i think yeah actually i forgot uh, that's gonna be there I'm, I'm not sure if i'll be able to see it maybe it's out on the floor i'll have to check on wednesday but mm-hmm. that is a game i'm very yeah. hyped for uh yeah and yeah it's looking like it's even 60 fps on the switch which is uh, a nice change of pace after sonic frontiers Mm. though that was obviously a more ambitious sort of game (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah there's i mean the list is is quite extensive of what's going to be on what is mooted to be microsoft's biggest show floor booth to date uh, Ghost of Honor 2, Mortal Kombat 1, Immortals mm. of Avium. We've got more on that in the direct later. Cyberpunk 2077, Phantom Liberty. Um, just going down the list here, stuff that catches my eye. I'm sure I'm missing a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, Armored Core 6. Oh, I mean, that's going to be I'm, out I'm, like the following week. So. Yeah, it's like it's like <laughs> almost released at yeah, this it's point. Yeah, basically done. <laughs> Yeah, obviously Starfield isn't going to be playable. There are going to be presentations where you can get a look at the game. And um, yeah, I'm curious what you think of that, because on the one hand, you know, the game's literally done now. It's gone gold. Uh, you would expect it to be there. But and but on the other on the other hand, can you actually do like a 20 minute demo of a game this vast that's actually meaningful? I still think it should have been done. I still think it should have been playable um, because typically those uh, Bethesda uh, RPG games do seem to have like an opening segment, right? You know, if you go back to Skyrim, Fallout uh, 3, Fallout 4, there's always like an opening segment that sets the scene for the game. Surely they could have hived that off. I don't know. I'm sure there's good reasons. Maybe they thought just the hands-off presentation would give you a much better view of the overall sort of scale of the game. Package, yeah. Um, yeah, I, but obviously we're really looking forward to What about to uh, the Unreal 5 game that was just got a new Gamescom trailer? Neo Berlin 2087. I feel like this is a, a game made for Alex. <laughs> I watched that trailer, and I also watched the trailer that came out a while back. Because yeah. I remember being like, oh, there's a game that takes place in Berlin. That's interesting. My first impression was, I see one building from the current Berlin in the entire trailer. And then there's a building in the trailer as well that is not in berlin but outside of berlin so um, it's 2087 though it's 2087 obviously 80 years can change a lot there's yeah they might yeah. be moving buildings about by exactly. the <laughs> yeah and destroy they put them on them. tracks and destroy most of them you never know um but i watched that trailer and I, I mean it's ue5 but to me it looks like a lot of it's it's maybe i don't know if it's a budgetary thing but looks like a lot of like ue5 i can see like the text seams and strings like i can see like a metahuman actor that is being driven probably by like uh like webcam mocap or something like that yep. and and i can see a lot of like i don't know the the performance was really screen tearing. In the trailer there's a lot of screen, screen tearing. Te- yeah and you know um i'm interested in the fact in the other gameplay video they released like months ago kind of had like a little bit of a crisis vibe because they it's like about sneaking and you can uh modify your weapons in real time while playing which is you know it's like crisis i guess um Mm -hmm. but not too interested actually uh because it reminded me of like the worst aspects of detroit to human in terms of like what is being said it sounded very cheesy um but uh well, that's, that's my impression okay. of that trailer. <laughs> I'll, I'll Any other that. things? I mean, um, AMD are going to be there. They have announced that there will be product announcements. They seem to be from the Radeon team, uh, which is interesting. So we would assume that there would be something. I don't know. I'm just going to. This is complete guesswork, by the way. Uh, 7800 XT would make sense. The 7900 GRE seems to have been a really weird product. Yeah, whatever that's about. So we, you know, it was a, a full Navi, th- well, not full, it was a Navi 31 based uh, product. So it's based on the top end die, but the performance uh, we've seen brings it more I, into line with, I think it was like 6800 XT. 
Yeah, which is uh, which is surprising. Um, so who knows what we're going to oh, see? Oh man, there. they um, they should bring out the masterful move of announcing FSR four and like one other. Yeah, one before up they Nvidia. release three, just skip a number. <laughs> They're straight for four or F- do it. or FSR three hundred and sixty. You know. <laughs> Yeah, you can't beat them on the numbers game. You just make an entirely new number up. Uh, go to the Microsoft wow. route. Um, uh, that's, and, then, that, and then you go back to one. You go yeah. from oh, Xbox yeah. 360 to Xbox, Xbox One. So we'll FSR O N E. That's well, that's, actually, you know, we 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 do an FSR three update. I think. Oh, that would be good. I mean, it would be uh, fine to figure out what game it's going to launch in, uh, what it's useful for. They, you know, the very brief presentation they had at was it GDC, the, where they mentioned it, like in a couple slides. Um, it'd be nice to know something about that. But that 7900 GRE is um, a little bit confusing to me because I think its price point is like around where a modern, like, um, legacy 6800 xt was but it was like performing at around the exact same thing so it's like another price performance stagnation thing and it makes me wonder a little bit if they announce the 7800 xt if it's actually going to be lower performing than the 6800 xt i can't see that um know, maybe we'd have just, to recheck the numbers here but i think it might be the case that it's uh closer to the, the gre is in sort of 6900 69 50 XT territory, but who knows what's what's going uh, okay. what's going to happen with the 7800. Um, but uh, the GRE was an OEM only product; uh, you couldn't really buy it solar. So I suspect that's probably why. You know, maybe it, that's it, why. It, yeah, yeah. Uh, it had sort of cuts to L3 cache and and stuff like that, which would uh, obviously have an impact on performance. I'm very curious to see what AMD have got for us because, um, yeah, they do need to refresh the lineup. They just seem to be rolling out um, admittedly very well-priced last-gen products to take on the current-gen uh, mm-hmm. NVIDIA products. And uh, yeah, with, with 6750 XT in particular, they had a pretty compelling story. But let's see some new products. Let's see what they've got there. I'm curious to see if the ray tracing boost will persist down the stack. Uh, it was very questionable in the 7600 as to whether it was that much faster than the 6650 XT. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, elsewhere in Gamescom, no Sony, which uh, I guess they've got Spider-Man, but beyond that, they, they do seem to be light on content at the moment, but I would have loved to have seen Spider-Man. Uh, John, uh, Nintendo, um, there's no sign of any um, I, new product no, announcements. No, I don't think so. Um Right. Yeah, they're kind of in a weird spot because obviously they have a new console in the works that's going to be hitting hopefully next year. Uh, so they're kind of, you know, there is Super Mario Wonder, which is coming out. I'm a little bit surprised that they didn't bring that to the show because I feel like that would have been a perfect game to demonstrate here. But yeah, hmm, it's it's a weird time for Nintendo and it's a bit of a shame that we're not going to see anything new from them, likely, unless they bring it as a mm-hmm. surprise, of course, but I don't think it's happening. Yeah, and um, we fairly sure there won't be too much from Intel, though we have had a, a briefing that we'll talk about in the next news story. Some exciting stuff there, but no new product announcements that I'm aware of. Um, NVIDIA, I guess, you know, the stack is out now for 40 series, um, and it's going to be about software. It's got to be about software. What else could it be? Um, in their position, I think it's got to be it's got to be about doubling down on DLSS and DLSS support. And ray tracing. Um, and yeah. ray tracing, obviously, yeah. <laughs> and um, it would be great to see some new innovations there. Um, be interested to see what they've got there. And uh, man, Alex, I really do hope that we get to see Alan Wake on yep. PC. Yeah, that'd, that'd, that'd be key. I think, yeah, I, do, yeah I, I really want to stress why this one is important because Control is such an important title in the kind of um, progression of ray tracing across the generation. It wasn't great shakes on the consoles but on pc it basically you know through the kitchen sink yeah. <laughs> at us in terms of features and it was incredible and um yeah it's it's got to be next level this, stuff and remedy this will be an interesting example though su- supposing it does support all these ray tracing features which i'm sure it will uh because alan wake the environments in that game are going to be so different from control right so it's gonna have mm-hmm, to focus yep. on highlighting other aspects of ray tracing like rtgi uh, versus say like reflections that was a huge part of uh, control right and 
everything was yeah. glossy, metallic, whatever in that game. And this is obviously going to be more natural environments with a lot mm. less potential for reflections. So uh, I'm yeah. very excited to see what they do with it. Yeah. Same. Um, yeah, I guess um, from another sort of NVIDIA perspective, they've basically laid out the um, the groundwork for their vision for the future of PC gaming, which is past facing, right? But we've only got Cyberpunk 2077 as an example there. Uh, Phantom Liberty is obviously coming. It's, you know, essentially the work is done. So we will have RT Overdrive in Phantom Liberty, I think it's fair to say. It's awesome. Uh, yeah. the, quest the question is what other games could do it because it's all very well having an integration with NVIDIA. Uh, to, to produce this. Um, but where do you go next? You've got to make a statement to the gamers, to developers, that, that there is a future in past facing. And that's the kind of statement I'd like to see. Uh, anything else um, that you, you're looking forward to from Gamescom, apart from the socialization aspects, the concept that we are actually going to be in physically physical proximity to one another? <laughs> oh, gosh. That does mm. mean that we're going to be having, I guess, uh, we're going to be filming a direct where we're not actually in our... Uh, bespoke <laughs> locations, but we're probably in some godforsaken hotel. Room. Yeah, that's probably yeah. how it's going to be. I mean, if we can, and if the weather allows it, I would. I mean, I don't know how possible it is. It would be nice to like have our cameras in an area where it's somewhat outdoorsy. Yeah, at yeah, least in the background to get some to get some more space. I don't the, know how possible the audio it was. is uh, troublesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah who, I was, even and the lighting. You literally just gave Oliver a heart attack there, Alex. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Not that. He doesn't need that right now. Massive panic attack. We don't yeah. need that right now. I'll put it right now. Ah, so yeah, the Gamescom, really looking forward to it. And obviously I've got three years of uh, collected things that you've asked me to buy in the UK mm. that I'm going to have to bring out. Thank you. <laughs> and I've got basically a whole wardrobe full of all these brown packages. Yeah, you've got brown packages. I think one of them is a CDI power supply. Yeah, I mean, is it a fire risk? No. I mean, everything else to do with the system is a disaster. I, mean, I think it's safe. <laughs> safe for transportation okay. i'm not sure what, what they'll think of it at the border though <laughs> yes, sir <laughs> of course what is at least it's just a power brick versus the time audi tried to bring the cdi light gun to my house from norway okay the German, oh, no. uh, yeah the they they didn't like it too much they were like what is this thing and he got in trouble <laughs> for it <laughs> So I was at uh, Tel Aviv Airport and uh, I took a PSP development kit through security. Oh, wow. And uh, let's just say it didn't go down well. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I got daubed with all sorts of uh, explosive detection chemicals mm -hmm. and had a massive chemical uh, allergic reaction on the plane. Oh, oh no. Yeah. Oh, and no. Uh, Yeah, I sort of got home and... Um, <laughs> This is, this, we, this is going off wildly on a bizarre tangent. But yeah, basically I had to sort of uh, force feed myself antihistamines and then head to the doctor the following morning. Oh my God. Uh, and then I got industrial grade uh, anti-allergic <laughs> drugs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man, that, that wasn't great. Um, hopefully, uh, yes, I mean, I, I did send a message to uh, John and Alex. Is there anything you want from the UK? And John just put large M2... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's, yeah, yeah with obviously junk. with all these big video files uh it is very important to have a good amount of space on a fast drive yeah <laughs> definitely it's uh it's uh these times getting out of hand yeah this point where now i start a video and i i usually scratch pad do a two terabyte and it's it's only a couple hours man it's only a couple yeah. hours of recording <laughs> Okay, well, look, that's our sort of Gamescom preview, uh, interspersed with uh, completely inappropriate personal details. Uh, let's move on to the next news topic. This week, we had a briefing from Intel uh, with their sort of um, PR mastermind or other engineering mastermind, Tom Peterson. Mm -hmm. uh, if you saw our um, on-location interview with Tom last year about XCSS and other Intel Arc stuff, uh, you'll know that he's basically a man who loves to share detail. And man, we got a lot of detail in this briefing. Alex and I were there. Um, there were three things, I guess, we, we talked about, Alex, uh, starting with the Arc DX11 driver. Uh, we talked a bit about XESS. I guess we can talk about that one a bit later. Mm -hmm. And they've got a new performance tool. Let's quickly talk about the DX11 driver for Arc because 
uh, similar to what they did with DX9, they've completely re-architected uh, the DX11 driver, and by God, it needed it needed it based on the recent tests that I've done. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thoughts on that? I mean, we're basically seeing a continued um, evolution of Arc, and it's all heading in the right direction. Yeah. So for them, it's interesting. Uh, usually, even with the X11, you'd imagine for most games uh, that a modern 13th generation Intel chip would provide enough CPU power to make something that is only as powerful as an A750 be GPU limited all the time. But with their previous driver, um, according to Intel's own data that they showed us, as well uh, as just our guess, our general experience with Intel Arc under DX11, that was not the case necessarily. And that is kind of what the new driver backend is looking to address, where yeah. um, they are, for DX11 games, making it much more CPU light and CPU multi-threaded in the driver, uh, which greatly enhances even something like an A750, which, once again, is not a very large and powerful video card. You would usually expect, like, oh, yeah, you can be totally CPU bound on something like an RTX 4090 on a 13th gen. Uh, CPU in some games, but this on an A750, which is, mm, I don't know, one fourth of maybe even less of the power of something like an RTX 4090. Um, so yeah, yeah. So there's that. There's something like that, and that's that's basically what it's all about. And as a part of this, um, I think going into it, they mentioned that it ranges from in the number of DX11 titles anywhere is from on a on a i5 a something like somewhere somewhere between five and 33%, I think we're actually, depending upon the title, um, when normalized versus their previous yeah. drivers. And that's actually a pretty huge bump for a card that you would usually expect to be GPU limited. So that's awesome. That's what we want to see. We want to see them be more competitive so that it brings really you know good products to that mid-range. And the A750 has been really cheap for a long time now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they also showed us some data from i9, which showed that the gains from the U driver are more limited. And that's simply because the i9 is more powerful as a CPU. Mm -hmm. And um, it seemed to be uh, you know, mostly down to the fact that it had higher clock and more cache, that it was more performant on the existing driver. But obviously, when you've got an A750, which is a $250 card, the concept of being of it being paired with an i9 is basically ludicrous. Yeah, it's uh, bad. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, basically, it looks like the new driver just addresses stuff like better mem memory management and um, isn't single threaded like the old one was. I mean, I brought up in the meeting that I felt that the DX11 performance on the existing driver was similar to what I was experiencing with, an, with a Radeon back in the day, which... Right. Yeah, had also had a um, a single threaded DX11 driver. This is really crucial because in my uh, GPU review um, of like the budget cards, I just went back and tested random DX11 games, and um, Assassin's Creed Unity was a disaster until they patched it, which may have been as a result of my disaster. <laughs> Who knows? Um, and um, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare just didn't work uh, after. It just sort of crashed in the first level. And just elsewhere, you know, in Crisis 3 Remastered, it was interesting to note that in less dense areas, um, it could compete with the RTX 3060, but in more dense areas, there was a drop-off in performance. And that's exactly what used to happen on the old AMD driver, and it's exactly because it's a single-threaded driver. So, yeah, I mean, this is essential stuff for ARC, and it's all happening. And um, I guess, where do we go next? Because... Um, Arc was delayed, and it's now gone from like a mid-range product to, you know, sort of like a $250 product, right? which is sort of almost entry level these days, I'd say, for um, a, a mainstream GPU. So, you know, progress on Arc, and it's, it's great to see it, and um, no sort of indication of new products, unfortunately, but I can't believe they're just going to... Uh, pull out of the market as many people believe no i can't believe that um there's <laughs> that doesn't even make sense because uh like a lot of computing in terms of ai is moving towards things that yeah what gpus were and that's what they have and those are their products that are ai competitive for them at the moment so they yeah. wouldn't get out of it this, i don't even know why anyone would say any of those things whatever um well you know <laughs> precedence <it's>, uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> 
it's because you know arc has been delayed it's because it didn't quite hit, hit its uh, mooted performance targets it was supposed to be taking on like 3070 and uh, 2080 ti and it didn't but you know growing pains right i mean you don't sort of overcome uh, 20 years of legacy baggage you know that, that the others have got by you know pulling out you know it's, it's an iterative progress uh, an iterative process it's going to take time um, so yeah, that was really interesting. It's great to see. The other thing, which is probably a lot more interesting, is that um, well, here's the thing, right? Most of the benchmarking tools out there are based on an open source tool called Present Mon, and it turns yes. out that Present Mon is open source, but it is primarily Intel engineers that developed it. <laughs> it's used in NVIDIA FrameView. It's used in CapFrameX. It's used in OCAT. Uh, all of these um, benchmarking systems all use Present Mon. Now, Intel has come out with its own spin on a uh, interface and a tool based on Present Mon. Got some footage of it here. It's really exciting yes. um, because, yeah, it's basically adding stuff to Present Mon that, um, uh, well, Tom Peterson's been hinting at it for, for I think, year, years. <laughs> he sold it to us. Like I, I think he even told it to us when he was working at the other company that he was interested yep. in this idea. <laughs> I remember in the parking lot, him coming up to us. He's like, what about CPU boundedness? What about yes. server boundedness? In his very Tom Peterson way, you can imagine him saying it. Yeah, you know, <laughs> conversations in parking lots is the way it goes. <laughs> But, yeah, uh, <laughs> it's like deep throat. He like comes over, shovels over. There's a car behind him with the lights. You could have uh, let's that. let's take a look at the tool here. So um, I've actually installed the tool here on my um, 4800s desktop kit, which is using the Xbox Series X CPU, and I've combined it with the Radeon RX 6700 non XT, which is the closest you're going to get to a console GPU. It's very very similar to the PlayStation 5's GPU. Why did I do this and not like a, a 4090 with 3900K? Really simple, right? It's all about finding performance hotspots, bottlenecks, and you're going to have far fewer of those on a tie-in system. But on this console equivalent spec, you're going to get some interesting data. So this is basically what the default interface looks like. And, you know, it's pretty good. You get stuff like uh, GPU temperatures, GPU voltages, memory utilization, frame rates, frame times. But what's new and really exciting from a digital foundry perspective, and I think from a benchmarking perspective in general, is this second uh, graph that we've got here, which is about frame time and uh, what they call GPU busy. So Alex, do you want to talk about GPU busy? Because it's potentially game changing in our understanding of how PC games work. Yeah, so GPU busy is, well, right now, what I do in a game to assess whether or not it is CPU limited is, well, there's a, there's a certain feel and visual look to it, I, I would say, in general, even without <laughs> looking at numbers. But when you do look at numbers in your current software, it's really helpful to look at GPU utilization. And if it's below 99% or below 100%, you have a, and a general idea that you are probably CPU bound. Now, there are actually things that could be tripping that up. You could say it could actually be PCIe bandwidth bound. Uh, it could be technically things like IO bound. Uh, you wouldn't really know. Uh, you just have to get a sense of it through other means at that point in time. But GPU weight, as it's described here, is describing the amount of First of all, there's a line describing the amount of time it took for the, the GPU to bring out the frame. And then the total frame time essentially is like, there's two graphs going uh, alongside of each other in parallel uh, to two to lines, sorry. And due to the difference between these two lines, you can actually see how long the GPU is having to wait in these lines. And that is what it's waiting on. And it's going to typically now, right now it's not broken down into smaller subcategories, which is something that Tom Peterson mentioned. That is probably something that the future versions of the tool could possibly be able to do. But right now you can actually say due to GPU weight, you can literally tell in this awesome graphed out way when and you're when and when you're not CPU or GPU limited. And that's incredible yeah. along a graph. It's incredible. Yeah. I love it. So I've got a couple of examples here that demonstrate this. We're going to go to, um, well, the classic Gotham Knights introduction sequence. Huh. 
<laughs> um, so yeah, this is basically um, 1440p resolution using TSR to get up to 4K. So it's kind of very console-like, right? And we've got RAID facing on. So this is broadly equivalent to the consoles uh, running in th their 30 FPS mode. And you can see areas on the graph here where the cyan line is higher, i.e. the frame time is uh, longer than the GPU. So we're kind of, see, uh, this is an indication that we're CPU limited in these scenarios. And you'll also see a corresponding drop in GPU frequency and utilization because, you know, the GPU is not being used because the CPU is, is um, hogging the, uh, is, is taking up the majority of processing here. So, yeah, this is an example here, and it kind of varies between the two lines being concurrent, which looks like balance, as, mm -hmm. as Tom Peterson put, uh, put it. And then you've got areas where the cyan line is higher, which is where your CPU limited. And um, yeah, if, if we go on to our next Gotham Knights run, where I've actually stuck it down to TSR performance mode, you're always CPU limited, but right. you really want those bars to be uh, closing up. Similarly, we've got a clip here of Flight simulation, uh, Simulator, broadly equivalent console settings, Xbox Series X settings here, uh, ironically running on what is close to the PlayStation 5 GPU. But again, it's, pre <laughs> it's pretty much um, always the case that the CPU is, uh, is, mm -hmm. is the limiting factor here. So what you can actually do here is you can say, well, you know, if I'm CPU limited and there's not much I can do about, about that in the settings, what I can do is actually turn up my graphics, you know, yep. because it's basically free performance on the GPU that's just sitting there. And um, yeah, this this is really, really interesting. And um, there's also, um, just as an example here, um, moving into a Plague Tale Requiem, where we were convinced it was kind of CPU limited, but you can actually see that the yellow and the cyan lines there are in balance. This is kind of what we want. So even yeah. in this massive rat infested scene, um, both CPU and GPU are looking at uh, you know, pretty much balanced performances. This is really, really interesting stuff. Um, there's also a lot of um, customization features. So going back to the beginning of my second Plague Tale clip, you can see here how you can actually um, tweak the displays on the right there to get the information you need, the scales that you want, the amount of frames being covered. Um, and yeah, I mean, what can I say? This is this is next level stuff from Intel here. Exciting, That's right? Great. Do you think you're going to be using it, Alex? I uh, yeah, it's going to take a little bit to get it perfectly in my videos because um, I got to run it and I got to make sure I get like a setup that looks visually pleasing to a degree. Um, but yeah, I want to use it specifically um, to show off moments of games because right now like my Baldur's Gate video is going to be out soon and when I talked about Redfall and Jedi Survivor those are games where this is actually really useful to see because always when these games come out people post a comment online I have an RTX 3080 um, I'm using really reasonable settings and this game runs like crap and they don't post their CPU always <laughs> like everyone always thinks mm -hmm. everything's GPU limited and they don't take the time to realize that their CPU is such a big important part of this. And I hope this is about, I'm going to use it in my videos. I'm going to show it off. I want to start using it. Um, but I hope there's a somewhat of a proliferation or a democratization of the idea that you can be CPU limited in a game. So people start th realizing that more often. And these very basic lines that any human eye can see will show it <laughs> and it'll get more informed feedback for games. Like right now you go to Steam, uh, Steam forums when a game comes out and has poor performance people just write random junk in there and this would be a good way for people to just post a just a screenshot and be like this is the problem this is really yeah. good that's I actually like that really, really good point actually Alex because um, yeah I mean if we explain this and and tell the audience what those lines mean you know if your cyan line is above your yellow line then it's not the GPU that's the problem right there's something right. else in there that's a, that's an issue and it could be the CPU it could be PCIe bandwidth it's it's not a hundred percent clear but it, the prime suspect will be the CPU and memory bandwidth yeah um, so that's one thing that what I mentioned to tap and what he said it would be a great way to advance this tool in the future would be right now you could technically also say is it waiting on waiting on direct x which would imply maybe <clears throat> draw call bound for example uh so that's one aspect of what could be bounding the cpu performance and if there could also then you would have an 
an idea of whether or not if it's draw call bound, if it's driver bound by something else, or technically, I guess you could break out the sub components into this boundedness as well too, because it would mm -hmm. also have ideas of these things. Uh, how they would represent that graphically is a different question. Maybe the color of the line changes or something like that. I have no idea what they would do, but I think this is an incredible beginning for a new powerful performance tool. And I hope things like CapFrame X, uh, I, I'm pretty sure CapFrame X will take it over. CapFrame X is always about evolving. So that uh, that's what I would like to see. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And FrameView and all the other tools, they're all based on Present One. And this is like a free upgrade. I mean, it's, you know, beyond the GitHub. <laughs> so yeah, right. they will in in integrate all of this stuff. What I'm really interested in doing is taking all of this fair, all of this data and actually just giving it to us in a uh, in a CSV file that we can actually produce our own visualizations, which might be a bit more um, comprehensible to, to our audience. Yep. So yeah, lots of stuff going on there. Really, really interesting stuff. Uh, the final thing I want to talk about Intel was um, we did actually ask Tom Peterson about XESS uh, 1.2 specifically because, you know, uh, a lot of people are really interested in it. A lot of people are noticing now that it's offering uh, the DP4A path, which is for, you know, non uh, Arc uh, GPUs, a big bunch of them, is actually now offering quality advantages, if not performance advantages, over FSR2, right? Mm -hmm. Which is which is great. Mm -hmm. And um, this was an interesting conversation because Tom didn't really seem to want to talk too much about that, <laughs> and actually seemed to be a bit disappointed that they in the handling of how XESS uh, on other competing systems had had, had rolled out. Yeah, it's I, I get why though, because people would load up XCSS on their GPU, uh, which was probably not an Intel one, and they would say, the quality's fine, but it's really harming my performance versus FSR2 or whatever in this game, or DLSS for that matter. And then they would go, What's the point of this? And they would think badly maybe of XCSS, and it had the exact same naming, and maybe they wouldn't realize it's a different version of XCSS. The the real version that runs on Intel Arc. It's qualitatively a good deal better, uh, a good deal better, and then it's also uh, a good deal more performant on Intel Arc as well too. So that's the impression they gave off, and it had the exact same name. So it kind of maybe actually hurt their mind share a bit, and I yeah would tend mm -hmm. to agree mm -hmm. a bit, a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah, if we actually, uh, I was thinking to myself, well, call it XESS Lite. And then literally Tom said, <laughs> he called it XESS Lite. But he did say that it was going to find uh, great utility on Intel um, integrated graphics. Right. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see how that rolls out compared to FSR2. I think at the moment we're seeing a, a quality advantage over FSR2. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe the uh, the performance isn't quite as strong as FSR2. Yes. However, though, you know, if you're budgeting, you know, for the look of the overall game, you know, in terms of settings management, then, you know, it may, it may make sense to use um, XESS instead of uh, FSR2. For example, I've got some footage here of Remnant 2 running on uh, the A&EO Air 1S, which is a AMD-based handheld. And I'm using 900p 30 frames per second and XESS balanced mode here because it looks better than FSR and I've got the GPU budget to do that and retain 30 frames per second, right? It's mm -hmm. great to have options, I think, and um, XESS is only going to get better. Uh, but yeah, that's our Intel news. Sorry, there wasn't much to, to, to bring you in on there, John. Oh, I know. But... I missed that uh, conversation you guys that... had with them, so... Uh, it is interesting to hear about, though, and I hope that Intel continues plugging away in the PC market on GPU side because they are Absolutely. doing some very important and interesting work. And I think they have a real shot at capturing some uh, market share if they continue down this path, because I think the general opinion of Intel stuff is that, yeah, they're targeting lower end hardware right now, but uh, their products are well regarded. They're affordable. They're doing great work with XESS. I think people are feeling good about them. Yeah, the ray tracing performance is also strong. I yeah, mean, I mean, their uh, performance is actually very, very good. Uh, it's amazing for the price, I'd say. Uh, their art cards mm -hmm. are awesome right now. But I would really like to see them tackle the high-end Halo product at some point. Because, <laughs> Wouldn't we all? Uh, yeah, uh, that would be tough, though. But we'll see. 
Absolutely. Okay, that's all the Intel news we've got. Maybe something more will crop up at Gamescom that we're not aware of, but certainly a lot to be getting on with. Uh, let's move on to the next news topic. Okay, so this week it was announced that uh, sometime next year, I think it's July 2024, uh, the Xbox 360 store is going to be shutting down. Now, in theory, this doesn't sound like a big deal, right? Because, you know, we've got backwards compatibility. You can still buy those Xbox 360 games on the Xbox One store. But... It's not all good news on a few fronts. And John, you're quite passionate about this one. Yeah, so this is a bummer. I mean, we faced this before with PlayStation 3. We faced it with Wii. Sony sort of turned things around, though, uh, as I'll mention in a moment, there are some downsides to what's going on there on the PS3. But this this is a tricky thing. We're, We're entering this phase where the first generation of consoles that had a digital marketplace as a serious marketplace have reached the point where they're quite old and maintaining those stores becomes difficult on the back end Uh, business wise i perfectly understand why these companies would want to shut down these stores uh and actually i maybe i should spell out what they're doing here they're they're going to be closing the xbox 360 store on the console itself but also the xbox 360 marketplace at marketplace.xbox.com And what this means for the user is that you will not be able to purchase any Xbox 360 games that are not backwards compatible. So backwards compatible titles, they're available in the regular Xbox store now. Those will still be available, but anything that was not backwards compatible is gone. And this raises the problem of, and this this applies to all these manufacturers, is they've become almost the stewards of digital-only games going forward. Uh, and they are now entering this phase where a lot of these products will simply disappear as far as being able to be purchased. And that is a real Mm. shame, especially the further we get out from this, there's basically going to be games that are lost to time. And the only real uh, saving grace here is that pirates have cracked these systems. So these games have been pirated. So the pirates have basically saved us once again. They are uh, champions of preservation, and it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't have to be that way, but that's how it is. And uh, that's kind of the concerning part is that we have to rely on sort of not so legal means to keep these games available long term. Yes, users that purchase some of these titles will still be able to download them, which is good, although we'll see how long that lasts, because I think that is no I don't, I don't know for sure, but I feel like you can't do that on the Wii at this point. Like, it, I think Wii is completely dead. Um, but let's say we get to a point in the future and this is where my concern stems from where you have a console that hasn't actually been cracked open yet. And it might seem silly given that it's, you know, you've got the Xbox marketplace now for Xbox one and Xbox series and all that, but there could come a time when all of a sudden many years in the future, let's say that Xbox one store disappears. Uh, again, that may may or may not happen. I don't know what to say about that. It's just theoretical, but that's that's a system that has not been cracked, right? The security has not been cracked on Xbox One as far as I know. So theoretically, if that disappeared, that's it. There would be a ton of digital games lost forever, uh, especially ones that didn't get a multi-platform release. That is what I'm concerned about long-term. Um, so we can't always rely on on the community ripping this stuff and saving it or, you know, even getting it onto the consoles. If it hasn't been cracked, it hasn't been emulated, what do you do? Uh, that's kind of right. the big worry there, right? Does that make sense? It makes yeah. perfect sense. Perfect they sense. have said that your existing purchases will still be downloadable. Yeah. And I guess that's simply the case of having files on a CDN somewhere. But um, I suspect it's the server maintenance and the front end maintenance that they are considering uh, removing. And that means shuttering the whole thing. Now, the, yeah, there was a there was a, uh, an outrage over the PlayStation 3 store, uh, which was quote unquote saved, but it kind of wasn't really yeah so there was a gigantic outrage of course i helped lead the charge on that i think back in the day and that uh sony turned around on it and they did not take the store down but in effect they've been quietly doing this and this actually applies to xbox 360 as well basically what's happening is if you look at those stores right now they are slowly removing games uh it's it's a very quiet kind of thing a little bit shady even but you're you'll you'll find that games are just suddenly not searchable if you manage to get a link to the profile they're just suddenly not available for purchase uh 
it's just like the stores are, are thinning out as we speak. Games are disappearing from those stores. And eventually there's going to be a point where there's barely anything left and they're just going to close it. So even though Sony did technically turn the PS, they never took it down. They are kind of quietly taking it down from within, right? Or at least companies are removing software. And it's also happening on 360. And that's, it's it's a real bummer. And I really wish that there was some way for them to continue to offer the software somehow. But I guess, uh, because, mm -hmm. man, I, I want to clarify something that kind of got brought up yesterday as well. I'm not really against digital downloads as a concept. I'm okay with that. Uh, even though I prefer physical media, I respect and use digital downloads. My problem is and has, has always been with DRM and storefronts like this. On the PC, this is much less of an issue. Like, obviously, you have storefronts like GOG, good old games that are awesome for that. But even on Steam, you know, there are easy ways to get around this in many, most cases, I would say. On these proprietary consoles, that's not the case. And these these storefronts, I think there's a lot more of a responsibility for these console manufacturers to hold on to this stuff. But because they're big business, uh, it doesn't make financial sense. And I don't believe right. they will do the right thing. And that's just how it's going to be going forward. And even worse, you know, with, with these stores, like the more control they get, if they go all digital, especially eventually, like what they they own everything right they control everything they can control the prices they're not gonna like do the right thing on this stuff i feel uh so mm. that's that's it's a, it's a whole situation the only thing that makes this better than the ps3 situation is that at least some xbox 360 games are backwards compatible it's like 600 games it's actually pretty good it's a good amount uh, but there's over 2000 games for 360 there's a lot of digital games that are not backwards compatible that are just going to be gone. Yeah. So it's not great, is it? Mm, I mean, how do you resolve this? I mean, obviously uh, a commitment to keeping the store open or at least having some kind of alternative means of ensuring that these games are preserved so and accessible. One idea I had. Via official means. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, via, via official means, I think that's that's the way right. forward. But what I what was your idea? That actually is the idea, and I, I don't know if they could do it. But so fundamentally, the issue with backwards compatibility on Xbox now, it works great technically, but they've gotten stuck with the licensing side of things, right? Where they can't repackage the game because they have to repackage it in a virtual machine as its own individual thing, and that violates like licensing and re-releases with these companies. And if they can't get that done, if, they, if the music rates aren't done, they can't re-release it, right? What if they there was some way to do like a general virtual machine like where it's like you load up an Xbox 360 environment on your Xbox series consoles and it's just like the Xbox, like a retro throwback interface and they don't do any additional repackaging of the games themselves? Like if they find a way right. to deliver the original games to that virtual Xbox 360 as just like maybe make it the Xbox 360 service. You just go in there and you're like, you know, you, maybe they could even have fun and let you choose. Like you, if you want to use the blades, you can do it. If you want to use like the NXE, you can do it. If you want to use the last 360 experience, you can like it's like this like 360 thing that you go into. But then it lets them create like, this loophole of being able to re have the games out there without actually repackaging them allowing them to legally exist on that platform and continue to sell in mm -hmm. perpetuity. Is this, uh, are you suggesting like backwards compatibility or, or some sort of just open platform? No, it's kind of backwards compatibility, but sidestepping the repackaging of the individual files where like you essentially I, I deliver the- I don't think the, you can get around it. What's that? Well, the, the executables are recompiled. No, 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 that's, that's what I'm saying. They are recompiled, but if they can create a virtual Xbox 360 environment on the Xbox series where it's just using the original 360 files with no uh, changes, no recompilation on that side where it's done through a different means. I don't know if it's even possible, but something where they okay. do not change the files at all. Legally, they I should be able to do it. I know it'd be hard, but 
But, but, but they are like recompiling that. the executables into x86 from PowerPC yeah, code. But I don't, so that, that's how it works. So uh, it would be... But an, they recompile it on their end, enterprise. and then they release it, right? And if it if it's like something else where they're not actually touching the files, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> where I'm where of your le- own console does it I'm thinking itself. of legal loopholes here, trying to find a way. Right, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I think if there was such a way, that would probably have been their original I, approach to backwards yeah, but compatibility. Yeah, but the idea here is that if they do it, what I'm suggesting is that it wouldn't enhance it at all. You just get the straight output of the original system with no enhancements. Uh, well, I don't think it's about the enhancements. I think it's about I, the f- just get, getting it to I run know, but requires if, the but recompilation. But the recompilation process is what makes those enhancements possible. But if they, I don't know. If, Maybe if they had the recompilation process on the on the client. That's PC, what I mean. Or, like, sorry, the client exactly. console. Exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Man, this is it's, crazy. It's too much. It's it's crazy. But all I say is, I just wish that these things would remain available somehow. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I mean, that is the issue. Yeah, and I think uh, somebody in our supporter program actually came up with a question that. Uh, said that maybe these big companies should actually have a preservation department and a preservation officer uh, because, you know, too much is being lost, I think. And to be fair, I think Phil Spencer realizes this. Oh, yeah, no doubt. So, you know, maybe something will happen, on at least on the Microsoft side, but there is this general kind of uh, feeling that uh, legacy games are not being uh, as well preserved as they should be, right? Uh, you know, we've all heard the stories of, you know, missing source code and stuff like that. And it's it's not great, is it? Yeah. Anything more to add to this? I mean, it's um, hopefully there will be uh, at least some kind of recognition from Microsoft that the situation is not ideal and needs addressing. But I guess, you know, the thing that sort of rankles from my perspective is the concept that we need to rely on um, basically reverse engineering of the system by third parties to to, to preserve these games. That's not no, a sustainable not route good. forward, especially with Xbox One, um, you know, potentially being next in the firing line uh, at some point in the future. Mm-hmm. Or, may, or maybe not, since it is fully yeah, backwards that, compatible. Yeah, that's why it. that's very theoretical, because it's fully backwards compatible. That may not come to mm. pass, but who knows about in 20 years from now, right? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next news topic. Uh, So this week, or rather next week at the time of recording, Immortals of Avium from Electronic Arts is going to be releasing, and this is a title that we're massively interested in, uh, primarily because it looks like being the first Unreal Engine 5 5 title to ship that is actually using, a third-party title, that is, that is actually using all of the Unreal Engine uh, 5 feature set, not just parts of it like Remnant 2. Remnant 2 used Nanite, Immortals of, and possibly Virtual Shadow Maps, um, Immortals yeah. of AD, Avium seems to be using the full package, so uh, uh, Nanite, um, the Virtual Shadow Maps, and crucially, uh, the ray trace lighting package Lumen. Uh, so, Alex, you actually spoke to the developers this week. You had an mm-hmm. interview with them, uh, primarily because they did a marketing beat surrounding, um, well, the features of Unreal Engine 5 and also their interesting techniques for judging performance in the options settings. Uh, where, where do we go with this? There's a lot to cover here. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to, so I don't want to steal the thunder of the entire interview because I would like to be, it, it exists as a text article on the EG website just because there was a lot of nuggets in there. It was a lot of really good stuff. Yeah. Uh, and it was a very wonderfully honest interview as well, too. It wasn't just like UE 5.1 is the best engine ever made. It was also like, we had issues with this and things like that. So uh, that's what was the my, one of my favorite aspects of the interview. It was with uh, three people working on the game. Um, a technical artist for VFX. I believe it was a lead general art, uh, someone who was responsible for like modeling and texture work as well. And then of course, uh, I believe it was the TD and technical director. Um, and I believe the, the kind of the gist of the starting part of the interview was talking about what is it like to actually get a UE5 game up and running? And for them, it was actually a challenge over time because the project started as a ue4 title and they had to move from that and they had to move away from base things that the engine did because it didn't fit what their game was doing 
And that's where a lot of the innovation comes in that the game is going to have on both PC and console as well. And one thing to mention is that this will be one of the first games using Lumen, Nanite, and VSM all together. Yeah. And it's those things are all extremely expensive technologies. If you look at the way the Matrix demo ran and, and what resolutions it was at, and that was a 30 FPS experience. Uh, so them getting all these things running at a 60 FPS target is very interesting. And I think it's going to give us a barometer to a degree of what we should expect, at least for the first wave of UE5 titles coming out. And mm -hmm. the interview was with Tom and I asking them a lot, a lot of questions about what things they did specifically to, to make the project actually come into uh, existence and run as well as it could possibly. And one of the really interesting things that they talked about was moving away from the uh, the shader system that the game has uh, as a base in UE5. They wrote their own dynamic, like I think it's like a pre-compiling dynamic branching thing to remove possible shader permutations or something like that, uh, if I recall correctly, exactly what it was. And the idea is even in an average scene due to this pre-step that is occurring at runtime, the game is saving a lot of milliseconds in the end on the GPU, for example, versus a stock UE5 version of that game that could have been. And this is allowing them to push the game to 60 FPS with the features that they have, as well as a couple other things regarding the art. Uh, that was another question I liked asking, where basically um, UE5 prides itself on Nanai being highly instanceable, so you can just like drop a bunch of the same versions. We've all seen like voxel demos in the past from like infinite detail, right? Uh, where they just have a bunch of instance versions of the exact same mesh, like rotated and things like that. That's what Nanite's really powerful at. But if you think about it, over a certain amount of time, you're going to see a lot of uh, repetition and it's not going to be necessarily the most pretty game, even though each you know asset is high quality it would because it would be too much of the same asset all over the place and they mentioned one of the things that their dynamic branching system for shaders allowed them to do was to get back the millisecond time to have more unique art assets in their environment actually which was really cool to see um some other things that i asked about is um as there's a blog about this already out right now they mentioned they're using fsr2 uh, on consoles, PC has mm. DLSS, DLSS 3, um, FSR 2, 2 it's 2.21 version, by the way. It's the, the latest possible version of FSR 2 that exists. And it's obviously strange. Like, why would they use that on console when UE5 was architected around using TSR mm -hmm. on console, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and their reason for it was, first it was a one-word answer, and then there was a longer answer. Immediately, <laughs> I asked, I think it was Tom who actually asked this question, and then uh, their TD just said, perf, <laughs> and that was it. So it gives you a sense that performance is a huge part of trying to get a UE5 game up and running at 60 FPS. Uh, but the longer uh, answer was performance plus their art in the game, which is a whole bunch of particles. Uh, we also talked to VFX artists there, you know, a lot of transparent particles that are wh whipping around the screen all the time, GPU particles. Those in their version of the game with what they're doing was ghosting a lot with TSR. So they didn't really find it very useful uh, for them beyond the performance difference. Uh, and I guess the last thing I really want to talk about without taking a lot of a lot out of that written interview, which I would like to see on the EG website, uh, would be the fact that they have this interesting, and I'm actually a big fan of this idea in general. Um, they have this uh, automated kind of way your computer is graded on like a cpu and a gpu level mm -hmm. and it gives it assigns them arbitrary numbers uh at the moment and then it says what each setting is going to do in regards to your cpu and gpu and this is actually an incredibly good idea yeah, because is. i always say i always say like i liked it a lot when i first first saw it in gears four or was it gears five that it was probably gears four when they first did it where they said like cpu vram GPU and they gave like high intensity, low intensity with like color coding and things like that about which static it is. But that's still not as perfect as some sort of gamified, numberified thing that tells you exactly what's going to be happening. And that's what the entire system is about. And it's give it's supposed to give you the the user an idea of what performance you can it can be expect based upon this budget that they're giving you. Interesting. And it's it's a very cool idea. I mean, the initial version that is that 
that is you you can have access to i think in the early launch period is not the perfect version of it uh their td mentioned he would like to have it be much more automated much more because right now it's kind of working on values that they have put into it uh and they wanted it to be more machine learning driven actually in the end and they were saying that would be a possible update of the game the, they, we also talked about possible updates to the game in the future in this interview so uh mm-hmm. there's a lot in there uh i'm excited to check it out i'm excited to see what other people think about it being a ue5 game uh and yeah uh, i loved talking with developers who knew everything they knew they knew what they were talking about and they were so enlightened it was really awesome yeah and knew what they were getting into in addition yes. to country interview <laughs> yeah helps. there's <laughs> they, they were very honest, and there was one moment where he's like, um, I could talk about this. Actually, I'm going to talk about this. You guys, you're fine to talk about this with. And that, that, was, a, that was a great moment. I felt, I felt powerful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how this all pans out because, um, yeah, Unreal Engine 5, we'll talk about this a bit later in support of Q&A, but um, it's changing the paradigm, really, of rendering in, in many different ways. And... Um, in ways that I think the users might have trouble understanding. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, hopefully we can do a job in, in, in explaining how this is all work, uh, playing out and um, what to expect and the role that upscaling is going to play in it because it's inevitable, right? Um, yeah. But, yeah, really interesting uh, stuff of that interview. And, um, yeah, hopefully we'll have a review of the game at some point uh, at launch or just after we have to wait and see how all the timelines work out there but yeah. we're really excited in seeing it because mm-hmm. um you know unreal engine 5 all features beyond Fortnite. this will be the first time we've seen it in a in a, in a shipping third party game so yeah exciting stuff um let's move on to our final news topic Okay, final news story of the week, and uh, there's a new release that John really wants to talk about. He's highly excited about <laughs> it, and um, having seen a few screenshots that he sent my way, I'm highly excited about it too. John, take it away. Yeah, it's basically Jet Set Radio 3, but it's called Bomb Rush Cyberpunk, <laughs> and it's something I've been following for a while from Team Reptile, uh, and it's finally out. And boy, I didn't know what to... Stylistically, it was obvious from the trailers that they were heading in this direction but it's difficult to gauge whether they'd actually get the gameplay right and the game design down we've seen examples before where games tried to follow this mold and ultimately didn't pull it off um this one though fantastic and it's exciting i mean i i remember it's like 23 summers ago would have been and i got this import copy of jet set radio the original on dreamcast and jet set radio future is also the main reason i bought an xbox So that's my original copy there as well. And the idea that somebody was making a new attempt at this was exciting and they did it. So I guess let me try to explain the way this works. I think they've created a unique fusion between Jet Set Radio and Jet Set Radio Future because those games, if you played them, they are quite different, stylistically similar, but JSR is more about you're completing tags within like a time limit and the police esc- escalates as you get those tags. So it's all about strategy of going where you getting which tags are more challenging before the police arrive and all that. And then you complete the level. Whereas future was more about large exploration platforming. Most of the police battles were just constrained within sort of a boss fight arena. And it was more of a free form style game. The way this is a mix is that you have these large open areas to explore that that you access progressively through the game based on the story. And there's a lot of, you know, a lot to explore there, a lot of platforming, a lot of difficult tags to reach. But as you reach them, you're essentially like opening up challenges to take on rival gangs. And as things escalate, uh, the police presence starts to ramp up just like the original Jet Set Radio, which is awesome. So it kind of changes the way that you're going for those tags and then eventually you face down against this gang and that kind of goes into like a two minute battle so to speak which actually is ties into the almost i don't want to say it's like quite tony hawk but it's a little bit more tony hawk in that you actually have tricks you have uh a manual you know there's grinding all this kind of stuff in there and it's about linking together these tricks and making huge combos and that is an aspect that was not in jet set radio really which i find really engaging trying to connect these huge links around these different areas and keep your combo going. And that just feels awesome. 
And on top of that, there's some weird, super weird story stuff with like this weird cyber future of people cutting off limbs and replacing them. And oh gosh, your main character gets beheaded at the beginning, and you're trying to discover the history of the head that got cut off, and you're trying to retrieve your head, and you're like at this weird cyber head now. Uh, and it oh get, and you end up going down these weird, like almost remedy like nightmare scenes where it's like weird floating geometry formed from memories that you're going through, but it's like crazy platforming and grinding through like this world. It's very strange, but awesome. Uh, but stylistically as well, they got it. They got it just right. Like the look of it, it's very old school. Uh, I'm playing this on PC. It's a Unity game. I was actually worried about that, but there's not a single stutter. The camera interpolation is perfect. It's 120 frames per second for me, 4K native, uh, really good anti-aliasing. It just, it feels phenomenal. It even has amazing mouse and keyboard controls, which shocked me. Uh, Switch version is also coming out right away, other consoles later. But then the music, the music is so important to Jet Set Radio, and they absolutely nailed it in more ways than one. They they dug deep. So they do have Hideki Naganuma, which was one of the main guys on Jet Set Radio uh, doing some of the music. And some of his tracks are just so good. But there's a ton of other very obscure groups in here, like really obscure stuff that is super deep cut in a way that's like very reminiscent of those original games where they kind of did the same. And the music is phenomenal, but it's also mixed the right way where like each different area has a collection of three or four different tracks that all seamlessly blend to one another. So like when you're going from one song to the next, they actually like, it's like a DJ mix combined kind of thing, right? It's not just like one track ends, new track begins. So it really kind of keeps this flow going through it all. And it has all the crazy dance moves of those games as well for the different rival gangs. And even the way they do like the intro with the tutorial stuff, that's just like jet set radio. So Mm. I mean, it's very obvious that they wanted to make Jet Set Radio 3 here, right? There's there's no mistaking that. This is directly one of these games. Uh, though it does have some extra stuff. You know, you have your inline skates, but there's also skateboarding. There's bikes. There's all kinds of stuff that you can choose in there. So it's like Jet Set Radio, Jet Set Radio Future, with a little bit of Airblade and some uh, Tony Hawk mixed in with its own storytelling as well. So I don't know. I, I've been absolutely floored and addicted to it. Uh, in the last day nice. since I got access and I can't stop playing it. I love it. It's it's if you like Jet Set Radio, absolutely go get it right now. It sounds awesome, John, but I've got to admit, things seem to take a bit of a dark turn when you were talking about yeah, things being hacked goodness. off and beheadings. No, you're absolutely <laughs> right. And that took me by surprise too. It's a it's a very like like uh it's not doesn't go this far but it takes me back to like 90s anime stuff like serial experiments lane where they're like messing with the player and like trying to do stuff where it's like all just bizarre stuff like it's hard to even explain you've got to see what they're doing but that took me by surprise it's all bright and colorful but there's very dark weird undertones going on as well which i find kind of engaging so okay yeah very cool game. Nice. I, I want to see it out as it on Switch. I hope the other consoles are good, but Switch is the big concern, and it's unclear if they've managed to get 60 FPS there or not. Mm-hmm. Not that it would be understandable if it if yeah. they hadn't, but it you're would. saying it's pretty instrumental to the. To it the would experience. be nice, though. To be fair, Jet Set Radio on Dreamcast is also 30 frames per second, right? So it's not like it's a. Yeah big deal in terms of the core gameplay it's still awesome okay excellent uh yeah look forward to seeing uh, more from you on that one john i don't know if we've got time no with schedule. gamescom oh, right now it's troublesome maybe yeah. i'll do a clip i don't know mm-hmm. but it's it does sound it's exciting. very very cool i love it brilliant Okay, so that's the end of our news section for this particular DF Direct Weekly. Let's move on to supporter Q&A, which is, as ever, the part of the show where every week we send out a call to questions to our supporters on our Patreon page, asking them basically to, you know, suggest topics, come up with witty observations, and, of course, supply us with questions uh, for our Q&A section. And uh, we choose the best ones, or rather, the ones that we're best equipped to answer. 
Let's start off with this question from Fiddler underscore 2K. Um, and I'm actually going to combine it with another question from Octolima. Uh, mm-hmm. Fiddler's question, though. With the Immortals of Avian PC uh, system requirements dropping today and the recent Remnant 2 discussion, I think a lot of people are wondering if this is what we should expect from Unreal Engine 5 moving forward. When should we see large AAA devs shipping UE5 games and do we expect scalability to improve? So just to put that into context, the low system requirement for Avium is a, uh, 5700 XT. Um, and That's the and latest Art- one? Yeah, uh, it's the one okay. I just linked to on that Steam page that you okay, uh, supplied. Uh, 2080 Super, cranky. Um, and uh, yeah, Ryzen 7 3700X, Core i7 9700. Now, what's interesting about that is that all of those specifications exceed Xbox Series S. So that's going to be fun, (laughs) isn't it? Um, Let us move back to the questions, though. And this one from Octolima, which is kind of coming at things from a different perspective, but I think it's worth uh, sort of weighing in with. Uh, would love to see Alex weigh in on this one. Playing devil's advocate for a minute with a combination of upsampling and DLSS 3s imp- interpolation, how much of a frame is even quote-unquote uh, real anymore? If temporal data is being used to bring a game from 1080p to 4K and then doubling the frame rate with frame gen, we can technically say about 75% of every two frames is simply generated and not in fact made of quote unquote real pixels. In Hmm. my opinion, these technologies are great for allowing higher fidelity rendering at higher levels of performance, but some seem to think of them as a cheap trick to avoid optimization. What are your thoughts on the matter? So the reason I've um, brought those two questions together is that um, obviously on the Avium uh, spec list. It's talking about um, those specs being uh, recommended with upscaling in the quality preset. So they're saying these are the recommended specs, but you need to be using upscaling. And we had a similar Im- uh, incident or, or observation, if you like, as Fiddler 2K under, uh, uh, points out, with Remnant 2, where, you know, obviously it was saying you're going to need to use upscaling here. Now, my argument at the time was Unreal Engine 5 is kind of built around quality of pix- uh, qu- yeah, quality of pixels, which are then upscaled, right? This was slightly undermined by them releasing a patch, which added 15% no. of well, GPU performance. So but I, Alex, I can see you <laughs> champing at the bit here. So <laughs> let, let's talk about this, because you've got a lot to get through here. Well, with the Remnant 2 patch, one thing is it did is a lot of people don't realize it maybe, but they also added an option for high quality shadows in that patch, which was by default turned off. Right. Which they might have just broken out a setting, by the way. So, like, I don't like the reporting about that because people, like, once again, like, they, they just look at the numbers and they don't actually look at the visual experience on screen. It could have, that remnant patch could have actually downgraded the graphical quality in some way that people weren't noticing directly off the way. Um, I have yet to see any good reporting on what the difference actually is in terms of visuals between the default versions of those patches. Uh, so I don't actually want to give lend credence to that necessarily. Um, the second thing I would like to say is that I have, I have a quote to read because I just happened to open up an article about the LSS3 here and that was linked to the NVIDIA subreddit. And there's a quote there that is representative of uh, something mentioned in that second question there. And the person says, I'll read the first two lines here. Ah, yes, DLSS, the technology that went from, now you can play this awesome new game on your 2060 with 60 FPS to now you have to have a 3080 Ti and DLSS to play at 2K and 60 FPS. So the idea is that a lot of people think that DLSS TSR, XESS, mm-hmm. FSR2, whatever, have become a crutch for lazy devs and bad optimization. And I just am completely against this idea in general um, because that we are also in the last three to four years, alongside the rise of DLSS and all these things, we're seeing a dramatic increase in the quality per pixel in terms of how much geometric detail is there, how much texture detail is there, and the quality of the lighting informing each pixel's rendering, whether that's through ray tracing and software and or hardware, and or just any other shading techniques. And these things don't come for free. 
people like you don't the gpu just doesn't get magically better at doing more expensive tasks over time and the entire reason for the existence of dlss is essentially ray tracing is really expensive we need a way to make this viable on modern gpus at high frame rates with good visual quality and dlss is a key answer to that so much so was it the answer that the entire basis of unreal engine 5 was we know we're going to be upscaling we have to build all of our technology with this in mind and it's they've done it in a way even where they are purposely actually limiting tsr and ue5 to not scale in a perfectly like way it technically should because right now in ue5 um if you run at let's say 1080p internally uh upscaling with tsr to 4k they do not actually uh change the geometric density output to the equivalent it should be at real native 4k because it would make tsr too expensive essentially at 4k so right now if you play a game with tsr at like 1080p internal versus a real native 4k you'll actually get more geometric detail in a real 4k which is kind of antithetical to the way these upscaling algorithms should technically work they should always use like the mip and the led level yep. of the output resolution but they're not doing that in unreal engine 5 because unreal engine 5's entire basis is nearly every single effect that makes unreal engine 5 look good scales on a per pixel level real per pixel level um Lumen does, Nanite does, and so does even VSM because it is a virtual shadow map that is trying to get as many shadow texels into the real screen pixels. And so all these things are now super dependent upon what your chosen internal resolution is in terms of how expensive they are. So adjusting the resolution internally of a UE5 game is much more expensive than adjusting the internal resolution of some game that came out three years ago that doesn't have ray tracing. So I completely disagree with the negativity around the usage of dlss for optimization and it's just literally graphics getting better and people getting upset about that yeah um <laughs> no, I, so I, I take issue yeah. with calling pixels real pixels or not real pixels because they're fundamentally <laughs> all still being rasterized with the graphics card right like what even is a real pixel versus a non-real pixel like they have to be yeah. generated somehow and I, I think it's all completely valid and it's just a new paradigm of where we're going right now. Yeah, I, I, agree. I, I agree with all that. And um, I think the, the the more we lean into these technologies, the better they become. DLSS 2 has improved over time. FSR 2 has seen improvements. XCSS has seen improvements. I imagine DLSS 3 frame gen is also going to improve more over time. And there's probably going to be even new technologies that are about trying to get as much pretty stuff happening on screen while running still fine and not because just there's so pixels from one frame to the next when they're native they're so similar to one another why are we wasting all this power getting two pixels that look nearly the exact same when we could do a nice interpolation and or a nice guessing or a nice reference to see what it kind of looks like but has like 90 percent of the quality and it's all about compromises always in rendering. Yeah. Almost all games use like lower resolution internal buffers, but we don't see people complaining about that. That's what I was going to say. It's like we've reached that point long ago, right? Where all these different buffers and render targets and everything, they're all variable resolution based on the need of the game. And that's been a solution to get the kind of visual quality that people demand. And it's yeah. been the idea of seeing a game where everything is rendered at full native resolution across the board, it's just almost a waste of pixels at that point. Yes, completely. It's too much. Well, uh, you know, o- Octolima makes a really interesting point in that, you know, he's pointing out that in the you know, Cyberpunk 2077 RT Overdrive, um, it is basically one eighth of the pixels are actually <laughs> generated conventionally and the rest is via upscaling, right? Yeah. However, this has opened the door to a brand new uh, experience, really, yep. you know, to a fully past phase version of Cyberpunk. And it works and it and it scales. Right. So as we've seen, you know, 4060 Ti can do Cyberpunk past facing $399 GPU. Um, and on the $299 GPU with the uh, with the, the ray count mod, 
you know, that, that, that GPU is producing a path-traced cyberpunk. And it's all because of frame generation um, and it's all because of DLSS2 providing those accelerating factors that are opening the door to new experiences actually being viable. They would right. not be viable. So in, in, in essence, what it's doing is giving tools to developers to take visuals to the next level. Mm -hmm. And as you pointed out there, John, uh, the concept of what is real and what is, uh, you know, um, uh, fake, if you like, mm -hmm. um, if people knew the, you know, the, the nips and tucks, which, you know, which have gone into games going all the way back to the dawn of history, <laughs> of gaming history, you know, <laughs> it's always been there. It's just a new tool that's been developed to, uh, to open the door to those new experiences. So, you know, the, you know, going back to the classic example back in the day, it was one of the Tekken games on the PS360 where the, um, the PS3 version had a lower um, resolution than the Xbox 360 version, right? But because the texture filtering quality was significantly higher, in the scope of that game's presentation, it didn't matter what the resolution was lower. You got more detail. So right. all of these tricks have been happening for decades, right? And um, maybe it's the fact that it's a feature that is um, brand new, initially exclusive to one vendor's card, but, you know, we're seeing the democratization of upscaling and soon frame generation. And it's just become, going to become another tool that developers have had in order to advance the visual arts. And really, at this point, I feel like we're reaching a point now where DLSS can and often does look better than native resolution anyways. Right. It's taking a while to get right. there. It's not true in every game, but, you know, it's continuing to evolve. Right. And there's going to be a point where it's something you actually want to use. Uh, just for image quality purposes. It does such a good job at cleaning up uh, aliasing issues and shimmering and in-surface shimmering in a way that TAA often does not. Uh, it tries, mm -hmm. but you end up with more artifacts there sometimes. There are always going to be games that aren't well optimized, quote unquote optimized, right? Yeah, but right. Simil similarly, there are going to be games that wouldn't be possible right. without these techniques, right? So it's all about, you know, there's a sliding scale, right? And there's going to be games that are on one end of it and games that are on it's, the other end of it. You know, it kind of reminds me of all the debates around CG versus practical effects that happen in the movie industry. And a lot of people <laughs> like to harp on on bad CG and they point to that, oh, that would be so much better practical without realizing that so many things, the CG that's good, you don't even notice that it's there. You may not even think it's CG at all. You think it's practical, but it's actually CG, right? That stuff's everywhere mm -hmm. and it's used very well. It's just the bad examples that stand out. And I think there has to be some caution with this in mind on the game side, because I do think when you take a technology like say FSR2 and you try to push it too hard, like setting your native resolution to like 720p or less, it can have a pretty detrimental impact on the image. People see that and they're very quick to say, oh man, it's reconstruction. This is bad. This looks terrible, but it's not, it's not the fault of the reconstruction per se. It's that it's being sort of used and abused a little bit too much. So finding ways to generate, improve the final output is, is critical and you got to find the right middle mm -hmm. ground on that, I think. Yeah, interesting. I mean, the other thing, of course, is that um, it is going to be the consoles that define this generation, right, in terms of um, lead development platforms. And um, upscaling is going to be essential. I mean, we saw right from the off with um, uh, the initial Unreal Engine 5 yep. demos, they're all using temporal super sampling, but upscaling, whatever. Maybe this is where our discussions on PS5 Pro come back to. If that thing exists and Sony is focused on creating like a proprietary reconstruction technique or hardware accelerated reconstruction in that, it could be a gigantic win for that machine if it is in fact real, right? Like that would be a great approach for them uh, with a pro style system. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So yeah, fascinating debate. We're not seeing the end of it, but I do think there needs to be some level of acceptance that new techniques are going to require the use of new tools to actually make them viable and to make them scalable. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, I've always sort of alluded to Immortals of Avium on Xbox Series S. That's well below the minimum specifications here. But somehow, I mean, we have to wait and see how they've managed to get it to, to work, but it is working, right? It is coming out. And it wouldn't have been possible, I don't think, without, did they, without uh, those upscaling. Alex, did they specify the frame rate targets then? They said 60 so, FPS, I thought. So they're doing 60 okay. FPS on consoles with all that. So 
Yeah, wow. Yeah. Can't wait to see it. Absolutely. Um, let's move on to the next question. This one from uh, my favorite, Dr. I. Crappenshitz. <laughs> <laughs> All we need is, uh, you know, um, team up with uh, agonizing Rex and Pay. Or add a bad fling boink Lee as well. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Who can forget? We need the the Avengers of DF supporters to step up. <laughs> the Mr. Crazy. Bespoke yeah. comes Mr. out. Mr. Bespoke, closet. yeah. With his, uh, cra- these crazy hacker aliases. Uh, are you happy or, or sad about the rumor that the RTX 4090 Ti won't be released? Is it a better situation to wait for the 5000 series rather than getting another even more expensive weapon? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so there were uh, leaked. Uh, cooler designs for what was going to be some kind of um, Ada Titan card or 4090 Ti. It looked absolutely immense. It looked kind of nuts, right? Mm. And um, I just can't help but think of the 3090 Ti, which came out for $2,000, had a massive power draw, and only had like a sort of, uh, I don't know, I think it was like a 10% lead over the existing 3090, which in turn was like 10 to 15% faster than 3080. And am I happy or sad about the rumor that the 4090 Ti won't be released? I don't think it will be released because NVIDIA can make more money from those big chips in the AI market. Am I happy or sad? The answer is I'm completely ambivalent because... <laughs> I, you know, in a world where I thought the 3090 Ti only existed because the top end RDNA 2 cards were competitive on raster, mm-hmm. um, it wasn't really a required product uh, uh, the way I see it. And I see the same for the 4090. I guess NVIDIA has a bit more leeway in that it, this time around, AMD aren't even trying to compete with the existing 4090. So the commercial need to have the Halo product simply isn't there. So I don't really care, to be honest. And um, yeah, I guess we do wait for the next series. I don't know what you think about this one, Alex. I'm like you, extremely ambivalent um, (laughs) because I think even if this thing did come out, which I'm of your opinion that I don't think it will, I think it's um, people want more GPUs because they maybe think it'll affect the price of the entire stack. I don't know. Um, I don't think it will. I think other pressuring factors would change those things so i i don't really care actually <laughs> one way or the other we've been at this point though for a while where i still feel like the 4090 is so capable that uh there are other avenues to improving your system first especially on the cpu side and maybe even the fastest cpus aren't enough right like I, yeah, I'm not, me- memory too. memory is an issue like there's so many io is an issue there's so many other bottlenecks right now like the 4090 is like enough for pc gaming right now and I'm not sure they would benefit that much from another even slightly higher end card until the next generation arrives. And it's not like they have any competition in this space either. There's nothing even close to the 4090. It's just like their high end Halo card. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's always diminishing the returns uh, at the higher up the stack you go, or they used to be until the 4090 came along. Yeah. And it sort of set the benchmark. But in this case, the 4090, yeah, you know. It, is going to be pretty immense and will be for a long time. And, uh, you know, do you actually notice these 10% increases in performance, right? Only at the absolute low end of frame rate, right? Yes. Let's assume that performance scales. So your 50 FPS becomes 55 FPS, uh, which, you know, in that scenario would be noticeable. But typically with the 4090 frame rates are so high anyway that the 10% becomes negligible almost. And it's got frame jet as well. Uh, where, which is seeing an increasingly large amount of support, and and, and rightfully so, it's a it's a really interesting feature. So I'm I'm not missing the 4090 Ti. And uh, with that, let's move on to uh, the next question. It's quite an interesting one. This this one from Gatti. Could path tracing be beneficial to games with highly stylized art direction? Think games like Hi-Fi Rush, Sable. Is rasterization here to stay forever for some lighting scenarios? Uh, interesting mm. question, right, Alex? But, but we we don't actually ever sort of think to ourselves, well, you know, I don't I don't need the full DX12 feature set for my new indie game. Uh, yeah. I'll go go back to DX9 features instead. You know, it just doesn't really happen, does it? Yeah, no, um, no, uh, it's, that's funny. Um, the, the question though, 
path tracing, I guess like what you really think what path tracing is, that would be every bit of the path of light being done through tracing um, and including the primary view rendering, I would assume there, if, they, if that's what they mean. So yeah, it would be beneficial. There's So path tracing doesn't mean you can't have stylized artwork or stylized rendering or stylized shadows. It's just a way of informing the the pixel being rendered about the objects nearby that it otherwise cannot see. That's all it's really doing. And you can have the the reflections, the lighting be just as weird or simple if you path trace a game. And in fact, the, the benefits that you could get, like in Hi-Fi Rush, they use like a screen space reflections that are filtered in a way that, that look comic booky. You could do that exact same filtering with ray trace reflections and not have them disappear off screen. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, <laughs> sable. I mean, you could get like super hard shadows and shape sable that don't have rasterization issues in them. That's a game. Uh, you can also get really good transparency sorting uh, as a byproduct of the algorithm and not have weird transparency issues, which probably every rasterization game has. So there's a lot of benefits to it. It's just about, is it worth the performance? Maybe not. So yeah, that's what I got to say about that. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I guess it will eventually become part of the of the paradigm, right? But at the moment, it is the case that it is a high end feature and won't be applicable to all games. But at the same time, some of the stuff we're seeing with RTX Remix and um, the thought experiment of how that could be applied to other games. I think John, in the past, you've talked about path trace version of like virtual racing. Oh yeah, I'd love to see thought- that thought of that just is, sounds astonishing, right? Yeah, I mean, like Alex says, path tracing can be used to just solve many normal rendering problems in a more accurate way. So that said, there's definitely cases where it probably wouldn't make sense performance-wise, given what they're trying to do. Like you look at uh, the Arc System Works fighting games, like Guilty Gear, Exert, and Up, where they have this perfectly dialed-in anime style. There's probably not much benefit to using path tracing there because they've achieved exactly what they set out to do, and there's not really any visual artifacts remaining that would super benefit from it maybe some like extra shadow precision i suppose but there's not really a need there and i think that's what it comes down to it's like can i achieve what i want without any visual artifacts uh without path tracing if so then you don't need it but there's definitely room for it i mean you look at animated films that are more 3d in nature versus like the more 2d animated look uh like Pixar films, for instance, of course they all use mm-hmm. like super high end lighting like that. that. That just makes sense. They're offline rendered, but apply it to visuals. Look at Ratchet and Clank. Uh, it looks great as is, but if they could have done path trace lighting on that, just path trace the whole thing, it would be even better, more like a real film and solve yeah. all the remaining visual issues. And there are some, uh, it would just solve those problems basically. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Let's move on to the next question. This one from Tom Bomb. Tom Bomb, I like that. (laughs) And and, uh, yeah, a bit personal to DF workflow, but why not? Hi, DF. The end of the year will be super loaded with so many things coming out. Do you know how you'll possibly get through it? Well, Tom, it's starting now, right? The next couple of months are probably going to be the most intense we've seen since the launch of the current generation of consoles, possibly even more so. Yeah. John, how are we going to get through it? I think it's basically going to be a case of simply just getting our heads down and doing what we can and hoping that people understand that we can't always cover their favorite game or their most eagerly anticipated game in in the sort of time frame that we would have in a less busy period. That's exactly right. We can only do what we can do. Right. And I think it's we have to go in the priority of, you know, the big important games get top priority and there's a bunch of them. We divide it up between us. And then there's the second tier, which is the games we really want to cover and talk about. And if there's time, we get those in. But then there's other stuff where it's like, maybe we would like to talk about it and we wouldn't in a slow period, but we just don't have the resources to cover it. And maybe that's where we can take advantage of this show, uh, where we actually bring up games that we may not have time to do a full video on and talk about it there to at least share our thoughts on it, right? So... That's kind of the idea, I think, but it is, it's going to be absolutely crazy for us. And I'm going to be like, and this is, I'm actually a little bit excited because it's the first time 
this whole generation where it's going to be, I'm going to be doing so much Xbox coverage and I'm kind of excited to be covering Xbox first party games again, like Forza mm-hmm. and Starfield. Uh, it's, it's going to be very, very cool. And Forza especially is going to get a lot of love from us. We have some big things planned, uh, including I do plan to do the follow-up to the GT Sport versus Forza Motorsport 7 video that everybody <laughs> has enjoyed. So it's going to be an interesting battle there to see how that plays out. But yeah, so. Very cool. Exciting stuff. Uh, thoughts about the upcoming onslaught of games, Alex? Terrifying in some respects. I'm terrified because the amount of stuff to do. And so mm. for me, I'm going to also expectations management, just like our good friend, Jeff Cayley. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say, I'm going to say like, you cannot expect every PC video that I'm going to make is going to be a ratchet and clank 27 minute banger. Um, <laughs> I would love to do that for every game with infinite time on this universe and infinite patience as well too. Uh, but that is just not going to be doable in the time ahead. I imagine like John said, the bigger games are going to get bigger precedence. And sometimes I imagine we may, I may be a week off or so or even longer before the review comes in for me because guess what? It takes a long time to do one of these reviews. So mm-hmm. that's yeah. what I got we're, we're trying to organize some backup. Um, yeah. And, uh, we'll, we'll hopefully muddle our way through <sighs> it, but it's going to be a trying time for I sure. I think there's going to be, we're going to have to give into the fact that for at least this especially applies to me, we're going to have to be okay with smaller videos uh yeah you know, sure. for, for the mm-hmm. big ones we can still go all out but it's gonna have to be like 10 12 minute videos uh for some of these games if we want to get them covered and i think that's perfectly fine uh but yeah. man looking mm-hmm. at october we got assassin's creed some of the big ones assassin's creed forza motorsport the arkham trilogy on switch of course the lords of the what? fallen alan wake 2 uh marvel spider-man 2 super mario wonder there's there's sonic in there as well it's the metal gear solid master collection which is just a, you know oh, no. that's kind of interesting uh yeah that's 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 not everything but that's a bunch of october stuff yeah and do you want to know the craziest thing is that when it's all over we're in december right things start to kind of calm down a little bit but essentially we need to do 30 days of work in 20 yeah uh, <laughs> And so it doesn't slow down at all for us, really. So no. it's, it's going to be crazy from here on out to the end of the year. And uh, yeah, exciting, but also terrifying at the same time. So welcome to our world. <laughs> Let's move on to the next question. This one from Logan Young. Uh, hey team, first time submitting a topic. In the US, there is uh, currently around a $100 price difference between a 2 terabyte PS5 NVMe drive and the proprietary 2 terabyte Xbox Series memory cards. I don't see much coverage from news outlets about this price discrepancy for storage upgrades. Microsoft's choice to go proprietary made sense at the time, but maybe now they should be strong-arming partners such hmm. as uh, Western Ooh. Digital to lower the pricing of the memory cards. The cost of storage has gone down sector wide since 2020 and the xbox storage expansions are only down 15 percent as of this comment i've both an xbox and a playstation 5 console but find myself buying multi-platform games on the playstation 5 simply because the storage upgrade was cheaper that's an interesting perspective um yeah i mean yeah basically flash memory has collapsed in price and ssds i keep buying them for some reason because they're so cheap uh, yeah <laughs> um, yeah it's still like what what 30 pounds for one terabyte samsung 980 pro i'm having that and i bought two of them in actual fact um but yes this has sort of um highlighted an issue which is that i think the playstation 5 solution has turned out to be somewhat prescient um in that you know storage upgrades for that system are very very cheap and it turns out that you know the high spec drives we were worried about the prices of are now dirt cheap, you know, a couple of years on. We haven't seen that kind of downscaling in pricing from the more proprietary Xbox solutions. But I do like the Xbox solution in that it does something that PlayStation 5 does not, in that you can take the drive yeah. out, you can put it in another machine. It's really, really useful. So it's, you know, six of one, half dozen of another. Thoughts on this one, John? Yeah, I mean, that's. I, lo- I love the form factor on that Xbox drive. I think it's super cool. And it's especially useful for us having Series S and Series X to test, right? Since you can yeah. pop the drive out and put it in another machine and kind of go back and forth like that. 
uh, which is cool. It's like a little cartridge. But yeah, I think we kind of I think I believe we've talked about this back when these systems launched that this was likely going to be the case. You know, when you do a proprietary yeah. format, prices aren't going to collapse in the same way or they're not going to go down and there's no reason for them to them really. Uh, it's actually, interestingly, this is the same problem that Sony faced with the Vita. And I think it's the thing that actually helped kill the Vita. So they had this stupid proprietary memory cards that cost just an absurd amount of money. Like compared to the equivalent SD card, it was just ridiculous. Like two, three, four times more expensive. And they're not even that reliable. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> which the Xbox yeah. One is, by the way, uh, in comparison from what I understand. Uh, the only downside of the Sony solution for PS5, though, is that there is a little bit of more of an onus on the user to choose the, a great drive. And even if it is within spec, yeah. the, it's not always a perfect it, um, performance. Like I have a, a drive in my PS5 that is absolutely within the spec, but there are some games that have issues running off of it for some reason. Like I can counter that Gran Turismo 7 problem where it would just crash. Like you try to load a race right. and it just crash the dashboard over and over again. It would lock up the whole system sometimes. And then I discovered just moving it off to the internal drive fixed it. And other people have reported wow. this too. And every time that they're like, dude, what do I do? It's crashing. And I say, copy to the internal drive. They do that. And it's like, oh, it works. So there's something <laughs> weird with some drives on the PS5. Maybe it's overheating. Maybe it's just not quite up to spec despite what's printed on the tin. I don't know, but there is a little bit of a fiddliness there that you don't have to worry about with the Xbox side. Yeah, and you do have access to a much more competitive market, which I think is the crucial thing here. Yeah, it has it has paid off for PlayStation. What can I say? Um, let's move on to the next question. This one from Eric Hurst. Mr. Yoshi P recently commented that he wishes there was one game platform. What do you think the benefits and drawbacks would be in such a market? I personally think a quote unquote single platform would have to look something like how PC is today. Open hardware, different competitive storefronts, but also hardware and software standards that all games could be built around. Is Mr. Yoshi P's idea a possibility or can you not see the industry involving in that direction? Thank you. Um, yeah, this is an interesting question that I included because um, obviously PC is its own thing, right? And I think possibly he's talking about consoles here. At least I hope he is. And we are in this weird situation where um, essentially we have Microsoft and Sony um, going to the same technology <laughs> uh, source with the same budgets and essentially coming back with the same core hardware design. So what if there was just one console and you could put on your PlayStation storefront, you could put on your Xbox storefront? The machines, Series X and uh, PlayStation 5, I mean, aren't that different. I guess things are different once you factor in machines like Series S, for example, which caters to a very specific part of the market. But what do you reckon about this idea of having like a single console? I mean, hmm. so where did he go from I, there? I feel like when when you see a question like this, I can see Trip Hawkins standing up and pumping his fist, saying, <laughs> "I had it right," yes. because that's exactly what the 3DO is designed to be. It was a, a standard, right? And companies could any mm -hmm. company could make their own 3DO console and sell that box. Uh, unfortunately, the reason it didn't work out is because it kind of breaks the whole blades and razors thing where you want to sell uh, the the razor for dirt cheap so that you can make money on the blades. But if you're only selling the box, you're not making money on the software necessarily. And that, that's why that failed. Yes. And I think the, all those problems are still there today. And it's a difficult thing to solve. But Yoshi P being a developer, I can absolutely understand why he would make a comment like this, because I think any developer, if given the choice, would probably prefer to target one machine with a fixed spec over anything else, right? That's that's just less overall work for them, and it, they can really focus on dialing in that one specific version. But I'm not sure that mm. such a market reality could actually come to pass. Uh, yeah. It's just... And I don't think it's necessarily good on the for the consumer either, at least in the console space, because competition is good and it's what keeps it's what drives prices. It's what results in awesome features. 
like i think microsoft being competitive against the playstation that's what got us the excellent backwards compatibility features you know that's i think that's what led to stuff like game pass becoming such a thing really is like they had to find a way to compete and they did uh on that front and they got a lot of people there and there's a those types of things i i think they don't have much reason to happen if you don't have competition right yeah mm -hmm. i mean the idea kind of makes sense to me from the, in the current scenario where we have sure. one vendor supplying both microsoft and sony but what it also means is that you wouldn't have a machine like the switch you would not yeah it, which mm -hmm. which is you know not great similarly i think there's got to be you know we talked about this in the direct before there's got to be some point where maybe microsoft or sony realize well maybe amd isn't the parts manufacturer i should be talking to you know if i want to differentiate myself from the competition maybe i should go elsewhere if you have this single unified console platform that wouldn't happen and um you know there'd be uh you know we're seeing a lot of stuff happening with you know stuff like frame generation and, and whatnot which only happens because of competition so yeah i guess it makes a lot of sense more for the game maker that it does for um, for the for the for the audience and for the market in general it is worth pointing out. Actually, when I was uh, speaking to uh, the technical director of um, uh, Modern Warfare, even though these two machines are very very similar, the amount of time that's spent accommodating the fact that they are two different machines built on two different um, uh, sort of development environments is like a massive time investment. So I can kind of see why why he was uh why yoshi p was coming up with this yeah interesting stuff an interesting sort of thought experiment but uh ultimately we need those different devices out there um let's move on to uh the final question uh this one from thumbs mm -hmm. hi all not a question but a suggestion for other digital found foundrians I usually watch on a Saturday evening, so I've devised a drinking game. Take a shot every time John nudges his glasses up his nose or says mm -hmm. the word caveat. Enjoy. Thanks for all the great content. Warm regards, thumbs. Uh, <laughs> this elicited some response from other patrons. Uh, Concrete Llama says, yeah, but can you do that in the here and now? I can see what he did there. Uh, Stephen Sazbo, Zabo, rather, adding every time he says, right, and you have... Uh, bought mm -hmm. enough to drink <laughs> and uh, this one from Darjar Co fellow founder while I appreciate the linguistic flourish of foundarians people associated with a foundry are generally called yeah. founders or foundrymen like all fellow founders we must supervise the blast <laughs> furnace, furnace. <laughs> Uh, after all of that discourse I've kind of forgotten what the question is oh yes the uh, drinking yes game. the drinking, drinking game, game. I love it. Um, yeah, I like using the word essentially all the time. So, yeah, basically, if you do have an alcohol intolerance, yeah, don't, don't, don't. Do I, this, I enjoy, don't I enjoy all the things that the regular viewers pick up on all of our weird quirks. Uh, oh, we have, and it has inspired there. some interesting artwork in the uh, Patreon Discord as well. <laughs> I can say that much, which is fun. <laughs> it, it is funny though, to think about the, the discussion over foundry digital foundry because i i think i might be correct in saying out of everybody on the team i'm the only one that's actually worked in an actual foundry at some point in my life wow i have actually I worked in a foundry no was it digital it was not at all respect. digital it was extremely dirty <laughs> and uh Were very you at hot. The blast furnace yeah i i did work around uh basically pouring the hot metal blast furnace so oh that's awesome really? Yeah, wow. it was uh, a, a company that that made uh, molds for machine tools. So, That's cool, okay. man. How did you end up at, at this particular one job? One of my first jobs. Okay. <laughs> it's just, you know, that's, yeah, how, that's how it goes. Those. That's how it goes. So, uh, But yeah, foundries so, are dirty so places. So unlike the digital foundry, which is nice and clean, that PS5 behind you, Rich, that would be a black PS5 in about one day <laughs> in, a, in a real foundry. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, do submit your drinking games and uh, we'll <laughs> consider them for inclusion on maybe a DF After Dark episode or something. That would be quite something. Yeah. Uh, but that's it. That's the end of the show for this week. Please do like, subscribe, share. If you did enjoy it, ring the bell for those notionally instant notifications. Uh, Random Gaming in HD is continuing to deliver this week. Um, oh, yeah. First, first generation Core versus 12th generation Pentium. 
that's that's content you've got to subscribe that's for. funny actually. yeah uh anything um sort of coming your way in terms of your uh, notifications guys <sighs> nothing good oh. lately i actually get a bunch of random stuff that i wish i didn't get usually <laughs> I, I had a good one and it's i was actually happy to see it get picked up wider so one, one of the channels i enjoy is uh, known as adrian's digital basement where he does these insane deep dives <laughs> into all kinds of like electronics, old electronics, and just kind of walks through it. But this week, uh, he did a video where he actually purchased brand new CRT mainboard and power supply oh. from China and installed it into an existing CRT. So he basically took okay. the innards out of an old Magnavox CRT and installed this new board. Uh, and it was extremely fascinating. And he seemed to theorize that the board that he had purchased was also the same board that was powering those AliExpress CRTs I talked about recently. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because it mm-hmm. had the exact same like layout on the back and front and all the, everything sort of matched up. So I'm pretty sure that there is a company over there that's manufacturing new like main boards, flyback transformers, you know, and all the necessary parts to get it. But obviously this isn't like an LCD, like swapping in a CRT main board has a lot of challenges to it and uh hey, so check i do recommend that video check it out so spoilers did he get it working yes, it works okay. wow it's awesome wow so yeah worth checking out any uh any sort of urge to buy one of those aliexpress crts we've talked about it but uh, oh, man i gotta look into that no still. Action. it's just the only they are pretty basic in terms of function right it's composite video only but what yeah it's not like a high-end one. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you're getting a quality level there. But it's still interesting <laughs> that it's new parts being made still today. Okay. Wow. I thought um, the creation of CRTs was like a lost art. Well, that's the caveat. I, th- I had to say it, by the way. In case I didn't say it yet today, <laughs> I wanted to throw that in there. Uh, right. Is the fact that I think the tubes have to be new old stock for now. Or pulled from some other source because right. they're not making new tubes and fundamentally that's what prevents new crts from being made and i don't think it's going to happen again it doesn't make sense and it's environmentally unfriendly to make crts so yeah absolutely yeah. okay well there you go uh, that's the end of the show then um thanks for watching and uh, we'll see you next week